I Sham I Shambhavi Tridhi, M Tech student, would like to convey a warm greetings to all the participants, structural engineers, faculty, research scholars, and to our esteemed speaker of the webinar on non engineer 2.0, a call to action. A topic that is urgent and crucial to all the academic and research fraternity. I will now provide a brief introduction to our honorary speaker, Dr. Martin. Dr. Martin, he is a founder and director of Three Smart Shelter Division, focusing on finding safe, sustainable, and seismic proof structures with traditional building techniques. He is an architect and engineer from Netherlands with a passion for alternative material and experimental building in low tech earthquake resistant build principles. He has more than 10 years of on-site design and building experience on various pre and post disaster projects in Sri Lanka, Nepal, India, and Indonesia. He holds a PhD in engineering on the topic seismic behavior of nominally reinforced rubble stone masonry buildings for which he did most of his research in Italy and Portugal and defended at Nagoya University in Japan in year 2021. As a follow-up project, he's currently involved with 25 masonry experts from all over the globe and accessing two case studies uh, on stone masonry buildings in, uh, for the Himalayan belt. Now, before we start our webinar, there's a brief announcement for all the participants. Please put any questions, doubts, or clarification exclusively in the chat box only. The faculty advisor for IS Rakti, student chapter, Dr. Praveen Kumar Venkat Rao, will address all of your doubts queries to our respected speaker during the discussion that will follow. We shall now hand over to Dr. Martin to start his presentation. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. So is the audio good? Yes, yes, Martin, All right. it's absolutely let's, fine. Let's see what happens on the screen. <laughs> so, There we go. So we have a big turtle on the screen now. Yes, sir. Now I have to get, yeah, all right. So uh, good morning, uh, well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's still good morning here. So my name is Martin. Uh, I'm an architect, I'm also an engineer. And today I'm going to talk to you about 15 uh, years of my life, which uh, started with Smart Shelter Foundation, which is an NGO. Then um, I'm, I'm going to show you all today. Oh, I'm going to skip this. I'm going to show you right away. Uh, so, okay, I'm an architect. Um, I started my career in, let's say, developing work in Sri Lanka after the tsunami in 2005. And I was in charge of the rebuilding of 170 houses at the east coast of Sri Lanka. And then the year after that, I went to India, Tamil Nadu where we replaced this uh, thatched hut, which was a school. Uh, we replaced this with a proper school um, with compressed earth blocks. So here we have uh, our ingredients, earth, which we have mixed with uh, quarry dust. And with the machine that you see in the front uh, and six people from a village, we made 6,000 blocks and we built this school. But that's not what I want to talk about today. Today, we're going to talk about seismic and earthquake. Because uh, the year after that, I went to Nepal. Um, this is our last project that we did in Nepal, which is in uh, around 2011, 2012, um, which is confined masonry, um, which I'm not going to explain today, because I want to talk about this, the remote mountain schools we built in Nepal between, let's say, 2005, 2012. We did about 20 projects in Nepal before the earthquakes. So. It must be clearly said that we did this before the earthquakes in 2015. So this picture I took of a school uh, is not collapsed because of that earthquake of 2015, but this is just uh, 20 years of, let's say, bad uh, construction quality, 20 years of light shaking, and then the wall collapsed. So we started replacing those schools. And we did, um, in we, we, we sort of chosen uh, schools in a line on a mountain ridge so that we had... Uh, uh, easier access to groups of schools. And what we did is we did this with a local partner. So the person that you see here, his name is Damra Bakta Tapa. Um, and he um, basically was the person that helped us there with um, all the communication and the administration. 
And then I, as an architect, I was in, involved in the reconstruction, uh, in the construction um, and designing of these schools. The thing is that at this point, I was an architect. I was not a structural engineer. I was not an earthquake engineer. So I had to learn how to build with hollow cement blocks or with rubble stone masonry um, techniques. Now, what we did is uh, we applied what we call the rule of thumb, the rule of thumb of non-engineered seismic design, uh, which is uh, just a, a number of simplified rules where we say, okay, keep it simple. I'm not going to do them all, um, but I'm just very quickly do a few. So keep it simple, simple shapes. Uh, so we don't want all these difficult shapes, uh, for example, L shapes or T shapes. They will have the tendency to start rotating in an earthquake and then you get shear cracking in the walls. So the, the solution for this is that you must cut up your buildings in small little volumes. And then each of those little blocks, you can make earthquake resistant quite easily. Um, what we did is we, um, we used the, the rule one is to three. So that means uh, the width is one, the length is three. Uh, we did maximum six meters wide, so that means maximum 18 meters long, so six by 18 meters divided by three. So basically we did maximum three classroom uh, blocks. And then the next thing you do is you sort of wrap it up like a little present, meaning we are going to create box behavior, literally box behavior. Um, but also we did in some cases, we did uh, vertical reinforcements. I'm going to go into more detail soon, but this is just very quickly a quick overview of what we uh, applied uh, 15 years ago. Um, all right, so this is what we did. Um, something uh, horizontal, something vertical. And then we painted that, uh, we wrote it on the building. So we literally, literally show in the building what we do. The building becomes a billboard of, of earthquake resistant design. Or on the bands, we explain what it is, why they are there, and so on. So we built 20 schools before the earthquakes in 2015. We did 20 earthquake resistant schools. So then um, I have to click something away here. Uh, so then uh, 2015, then of course, everything went wrong. The big earthquakes in, in Gurkha. And where you see this green star over here, uh, this is where our schools were. So we were close. We were very close to the epicenter. Our closest school was about 40 kilometers away from the epicenter. But from this simple graph, you can already see that most of the damage went to the other side. So yeah, we, we were sort of lucky on our side due to favorable ground conditions. Um, most of the damage went towards Kathmandu, even up to uh, towards Mount Everest, which was lifted up two centimeters. Um, and this is what we had at, at worst. We had some hairline cracks. Um, we had no structural damage at all. So out of the 15 schools that we built, this was really like the worst we had. So it's basically nothing. It is cosmetic damage. So we could see it in this school. This school uh, is plastered on the inside. And we checked it three times. We could not find one single crack in this building, not one. And here you see the school in the back. And then you see the old classrooms and the old, old buildings in the front. The old buildings were completely cracked. So they were cracked in the corners. The interior walls collapsed. Uh, houses next to our school collapsed. So it means that uh, yeah, our schools performed well, very well, compared to uh, everything around it. So the thing is that even though our schools behaved quite well, there, there's a problem. And the problem I already spotted when I was uh, building the schools and designing the schools myself. Remember, at that point, I was an architect and I had to rely on these rule of thumb. And the more of these uh, manuals uh, I, I started reading, the more confused I got. And, and, and this is a, a picture that I always like to show because this is also my opinion about, well, today's knowledge, uh, general knowledge about basically many topics. The thing is that we seem to have lost the basics. Uh, there's so much information out there, especially the internet is our biggest enemy. People just dump any kind of information on there and you don't know if it is true or not. You don't know if it is if it is checked, if it is validated or not. So I'm going to uh, illustrate this with two examples. What I mean with, okay, this, this, this confusing information. The thing is this, we do know 
And that's, that I'm quite certain about. But we do know that in, let's say, thinner walls. So when we talk about thinner walls, we say bricks or these hollow cement blocks. We do know that vertical reinforcements work. They, they absolutely add to the, um, uh, to the stability of the building. They absorb uh, seismic forces. They strengthen the building for sure. But the question is, what will these vertical steel bars do in a very thick wall? And the question that this, this is a question that I started asking 10, 15 years ago to all the experts. I said, okay, do we need this vertical steel there? There's there's two cases to be made. Case number one is that we say, um, what will this this one single bar do in such a very heavy building? So you must um, uh, um, uh, understand that when an earthquake hits, then the more heavy the building, the more lateral forces are being generated. That's why we also say that lighter buildings are basically better in an earthquake. But okay, in this very super heavy building, the question is, what is one of these vertical bars going to do? Is that really going to give us uh, the ductility that we need? Is that really going to strengthen uh, this corner? I per uh, personally think not, but that's an opinion and we don't like opinions. We need facts, but that's the third thing. What, what is one bar going to do? But the second thing is that what I need in this corner is that I need some sort of a bonding. I, I, need, I need some sort of a pattern in my masonry that makes this, this corner stronger. And the thing is, if I'm going to puncture this with something vertical, a vertical element, then I believe that it's going to, to weaken this connection. It's going to weaken the corner or the T-section. So those two things um, is, is basically key questions. Um, is this vertical bar doing what we want, yes or no? That's a super basic question. Now, you can see it here. The thing is that this looks like one wall, but it is basically three walls. And what you see here is you see a layer of stones on this side, and you see a, a layer of big stones on this side, and then there's some loose stuff here in the middle. And here you see it in more detail. Now, what you would prefer is you would prefer to have this stone into this uh, direction, right? This is how we create bonding. But then when we asked the Masons uh, in Nepal, we said, okay, but why don't you do it? Why, why don't you uh, make this, 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 uh, this stronger bonding between the two whites of the wall? Uh, then they say, yeah, but look, um, now I have to cut this uh, stone and that's a lot of work. So actually that's worse. The thing is that traditionally the Masons know that they have to make some sort of a pattern in the masonry, but they just don't do it because yeah, it's laziness. That's basically it. What you also see here is mud mortar and mud mortar is very brittle. So those are two things I don't like. And then this is an example of the schools that we built. So first of all, we invested in cement mortar. Okay, we know it's more expensive, but we need a certain strength uh, in this wall. But the second thing is the true stones, this, this connection. So this is very important. So we have put in many, many of these connectors in the walls so that we get a good and stable wall. But now you can start realizing that if I'm going to put these big stones here in this connection and I have an overlap there, then something vertical is going to disrupt that system. So I believe that cement mortar with good bonding, with true stones, does uh, the, the, for that reason, we probably don't need the vertical steel bars. And this is why I say it should not be there. But again, this is my opinion. So we need to prove this. But I'm just trying to make a case here of why I feel that the information is confusing that we have. Because then if we look at the, at the Nepalese building code, and by the way, the same uh, details you will find in the Indian uh, the code for non-engineered as well, is that at pay, in this case, page 34, we see one of these true stones here. So this is a building code. Remember, this is a building code. And then five pages later, someone says, yeah, but we should put a vertical steel bar there. You see, it's not even possible. So again, I keep repeating the information, and this is information at the top, right? This is a building code. The information at the top is confusing. So second example, um, how many of these horizontal bands do we need? So we know that horizontal bands, they strengthen the building, we create box behavior. But how many do we need? So when I started uh, designing my schools uh, 15 years ago, I reached out to the um, 
to the experts. And uh, this was basically the consensus. They said, what you need is five levels of horizontal reinforcements. You need something on the foundation. So the one at the bottom on the foundation. You need a sill beam, which is under the windows. You need a lintel, which is on top of the windows. You need something on the top. And we also like to put a stitch in the middle uh, just to break that that length of, or, uh, just to break that height uh, between the, the sill and the lintel uh, beam. So this is what we did. After the earthquake in 2015, one of the same experts said to me, well, I have a great idea. What we need to do, what we can do is we can, we can remove that sill beam that is not doing so much and we push it one level up into the shear cracking zone. And uh, this is also going to save a lot of money. Now, I can tell you that uh, in 2015 in Nepal, about a million schools and houses collapsed or got heavily damaged. One million. So the idea here is that if we can reduce one million of these bands, it's going to be a massive cost saving. Now, interesting idea. But the, the thing about the, tie, the, the beams, the tie beams, is this, is that they are continuous. So a continuous beam, this really holds together your walls. It has, a, it has a, um, a function that at the moment that we're going to take a look at the sill beam, which is the one below the windows, then it is punctured by three doors. This is what we call semi-continuous. But okay, this is still doing what we want. I think this still contributes to the box behavior. But now when that person said, let's push it one level up, all of a sudden it's getting punctured by all the windows. And now it's not doing what we want anymore. So this is this is my my critique. I I said to you uh, five minutes or ten minutes ago. I said the, the the information is confusing, and this is adding to this confusion. The experts or people come up with ideas, interesting ideas sometimes, but it has never been fully researched. It's never been fully uh, followed up, and then all of a sudden we come to a, a conclusion that is being drawn in five minutes. But when you think about it in more detail, it doesn't work. So this is my main critique. Uh, is that we have lost the basics. And it's very simple for me to say, hey, people, things are not correct. And, and I found out myself uh, while I was building these and designing these schools in Nepal, it's very simple to say, hey, something is wrong. But the question is, what are we going to do about it? So, well, my solution is this, is that we need to clean that pile of misinformation. We need to start digging and, and, and try to recapture, right? Try to refine the basics that we're looking for. So that is basically my PhD. So five years ago, I was, uh, well, I was already for years uh, reaching out to the experts and saying, hey, people, things, things are not the way they should be. And, but no one really listened, <laughs> so to speak. So then I got the opportunity to do it myself. And so this became my PhD, which I did in uh, Japan. And the objective is very simple. Uh, I just wanted to know, okay, what, what do we know? Where are we today? What is the state of the art of all this, these techniques? Um, and the first thing I did was a global uh, needs assessment. I mean, is it needed to begin with? Do people still live in, in, in uh, stone masonry or let's say non-engineered techniques in general? And um, what we see, um, and, and this is, has not been updated um, yet with the, the, the horrible events of last of, of this month in Turkey. Um, but what we see is that in, let's say, the, the earthquakes that had the highest loss of life, uh, usually this happens in the developing countries. So uh, India is in there as well. Um, but what we see is that most of the the, the the trouble, most of the damage happens in the developing countries. And also in, in terms of, of economic loss, um, we see that, the, again, most of the trouble happens in, um, in the developing context. But then what I did is um, I looked at all the papers and all the conferences and all the, the, the sessions that have been done at the last 16 world conferences. And then what we can see is that only 1% of all the knowledge and all the research is addressed to not to, let's say, developing context and non-engineered techniques. So there's a disbalance here. There's an imbalance here. And that means that where the trouble is biggest in, let's say, developing countries, but we do the least for them. So this is, means that something is wrong. 
And then I started looking at masonry itself, or stone masonry in particular, in rural areas. And I looked at the Himalayan region only, uh, Nepal, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Bhutan. We see that the, the majority of the building stock is masonry. So it is either uh, stone masonry, brick masonry, uh, earth blocks, things like that. Also natural materials like wood and bamboo. So if you only look at the blue um, pie chart, uh, a piece of the, uh, the blue piece, you see that uh, it's usually it's way below 10%. So concrete and steel in, in rural areas hardly is, is being used. In India, we could see sort of the same. So this is the, the, the census data of 1991, 2001. Um, here we see that stone masonry became, became slightly less. So I was very surprised to see the data of 2011, where all of a sudden the number of stone masonry houses increased. That was a, a surprising outcome. So it will be very interesting to see what happens with the next census, which was postponed due to COVID. Uh, I have no idea if it uh, already took place. Um, but my estimation is that in the Himalayan region alone, about 270 million people live in stone today. Uh, and that excludes Afghanistan, for example, where it's estimated that 80% of the building stock uh, is, is stone masonry. But we couldn't find the census data of this, but also China, Central Asia, uh, Middle East. It, it will add up with several hundred millions of people. So is it needed? Yes, it's definitely needed because so many people still live in, in stone. We could also see that um, in Turkey, in the rural areas, um, in the beginning of this month, there was a lot of damage uh, in stone masonry as well. So then I did a literature review. I just wanted to see, uh, OK, what do we have? And, and, um, and, and I kept saying it's very confusing, the, the, the information, but let's prove it. So I went through, well, Many of these manuals, I tried to find out, first of all, my, I had to, to, to um, set up my, my search criteria, because what I could see is that there's different type of stone masonry. The first one you see here is very round river boulders. You really don't want that. The boulders are round. They are already being pushed out due, almost due to gravity. The second typology is very random rubble stone masonry with mud mortar. Remember that most of the damage in Nepal was this. Um, about a million uh, schools and houses collapsed. 80% of that damage took place in the rural areas with what's almost exclusively unreinforced masonry, stone masonry with mud mortar. So second picture. This is what I uh, built in Nepal. At least what we try to do is we try to get some regularity in the courses, right? So broad two courses is, uh, courses is what we uh, call this with cement mortar. Now you can imagine that these three typologies all behave differently. But none of the manuals, or almost none of the manuals, makes that distinction. Uh, this is why I call it one size fits all. And that doesn't make sense to me. This is three dip different typologies. We should not treat them the same. Because, well, OK, we can understand that this is different. This is ashlar. So this means that the, the stones are cut to, to brick size. Uh, but that's a lot of effort. Uh, so this is why it's very expensive, but even a lot of these manuals don't make a distinction between this or even this. Sometimes it's just masonry, masonry manual, and then the, the stone rules apply for the same. It doesn't make sense. It is just not true. So for the stone uh, typology itself, the same applies for the masonry typology. So what you see now in the bottom is what I built. So I built what we call these, these stones are brought to courses. Uh, with cement mortar, but with horizontal bands. So reinforcements are in this uh, typology. The thing is that it's completely different from unreinforced masonry. So the first common, commonly used masonry typology is unreinforced masonry, which is, of course, something completely different than reinforced masonry. Reinforced masonry includes a lot of um, horizontal and vertical uh, reinforcements, as you can see on the picture here. The third typology is confined masonry. This is uh, a, a sort of, let's say, the, the, my uh, preferred alternative for, um, for concrete frames. But we're not going to go into this. But what I'm showing you here now is that we have four typologies. But in the, in the world at the moment, there is basically 
three typologies mentioned, unreinforced, reinforced, and confined masonry. So then the question is, okay, what, what is my typology then? And it is, at the moment, it is classified as unreinforced with reinforcement. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. This is very confusing ter terminology. So I would like to uh, make a case to, to introduce a fourth uh, category of masonry. Uh, we may call it nominally reinforced masonry, or we could call it semi-reinforced or horizontally reinforced. But the point I'm making here is that it is so different from unreinforced. And unreinforced masonry, by the way, is, is forbidden in seismic areas everywhere in the world. So again, this is also a good reason that why we should come up with a fourth category. And that fourth category, we must figure out exactly how it works. And, and, and so we need, and this is my main conclusion, my first main conclusion, we need clear terminology and it should be logic. So for example, we should very clearly describe the masonry units, the type of mortar, is it is it lime base? Is it a mud mortar and so on? But also the masonry typology, where I'm saying, okay, the, my research very specifically is about rubblestone masonry with cement mortar, which is brought to courses, which has horizontal reinforcements and flexible diaphragms. It is so important to do this, and none of the manuals at this point is doing this, but we must start doing this. Because this is very, very different from, let's say, river stones with mud mortar, which is very uh, um, um, randomly uh, with, with vertical reinforcements and a stiff diaphragm. It is completely different. So we must be specific. That's my first main conclusion. All right. What I also did is um, I started looking at uh, where is this all this information coming from? Um, where did it start? And it's very recent, actually. Only in the 1980s is the first time that, uh, uh, that a number of uh, engineers came together at the Sixth World Conference, which was in Delhi. Um, here's the two pioneers. Uh, there's a few more, but this is two of the pioneers of non-engineered. Uh, on the left, you see Professor T T Teddy Boon from Indonesia, and on the right, Professor uh, Arya from India. And they were the first ones that said, hey, listen, all these techniques for the West, they don't apply to us in, let's say, the rural areas or the mountain areas uh, in our countries. We don't have concrete and steel. And what they started doing is developing a very first code for, let's say, non-engineered techniques, 1980. And then in 1986, um, it was slightly revised, but the whole chapter for stone was exactly the same. And that was copied in 2004 and again copied in 2014. The thing is that between 1980 and, and 2014, and these are, let's say, the most famous manuals, the information has not changed one letter. I mean, it is a 100% copy for stone masonry, even the, the dots and the commas are the same. So that means that the, the information has not evolved. It has not changed at all. And now you see also that conflict that I already mentioned in the Nepalese building code. From the 1980s, that conflict is already there. And, and it, no one ever picked up on this. So I find it pretty bad, to be honest, that no one at some point said, hey, wait a minute, this is not even possible. We, we need to adjust this. We need to change this. So this is what I mean um, uh, every time when I say, okay, um, there's, there's, there's total confusion in the, in, the, in the information that already started in the 1980s and has never been solved, so to speak. So when I started looking at my uh, the manuals that apply for stone i could only fi find 47 that well uh, basically only nine were el el eligible uh, i had to reject 38 because they were so uh, incomplete um but the conclusion here is is quite simple is that there is no consensus on anything and it's not rocket science right it's very simple houses it's very simple units but there's no consensus even on the on the dimensions between four and a half and nine meters free span, that's a lot, believe me, in an earthquake. Uh, some manuals go up to one story, some go up to four stories. There, there, there's such a big difference between that. So like I said, there's no consensus on anything, not on the dimensions, not on the openings, not on the reinforcements, nothing. And if we now look at, for example, uh, there's two uh, codes for non-engineered, one is from India, 
and one is from Nepal. Um, you, we can already see the difference here, right? This is um, Nepal. This is just revised before the earthquake. So it was uh, published in 2015, but just before the earthquake. Um, they go to uh, one, two, three, four levels of uh, horizontal bands, something on the gables and vertical posts. Now, this is what I built. Um, and this is what I promote. I do this on five levels, nothing vertical, but with a very light roof. Um, now, normally, uh, but it's going to be a little bit different now online, but normally I ask then um, to the audience, okay, uh, what do you think uh, happened in 2015 in Nepal? Which of these models has been adopted? Or what is the, the standard practice after the earthquake in Nepal? Um, I'm going to give you the answer right away. It's this. So um, the thing is, the here is that um, I, I don't understand where this is coming from, to be honest. So the Nepalese building code, which is the one uh, above it, basically said four layers of beams, four layers of bands. And all of a sudden, it became about seven. And it doesn't make sense at all. The first the, the reason why it happened is that one NGO from Germany they came up with this solution first, I think, and they uh, had beautiful pictures. And they published this and everybody copy pasted it. So I, I said already that the internet is basically our enemy. But this is again what happens. Uh, it's just being thrown on the internet and everybody copy pastes and no one questions this. I can already tell you that, first of all, it's almost impossible to make, which I will show in the next slide. But secondly, you see all these little bits of masonry here, um, you get sort of concentration of forces in places that you don't want it. So in this case, more is, is not better. It's probably worse. And the only reason why this happened is, is I probably panic. That's why people start throwing in as many reinforcements as they can. So to show you, so like I said, I don't know why. It's not even uh, demanded by the code, whether the code is right or not. But that's not the point. Um, so... This is a picture from an organization that tried to put in all these vertical reinforcements, for example. And what they said to me is that uh, it's it's very difficult. First of all, you have to you have to do a lot of cutting because you want to sort of open uh, up this uh, this uh, this uh, this space where you want to cast the beam. But then what they do is that they're going to cast it, let's say, every 45 to 60 centimeters. So you already have a crack here and another crack there and another crack there and another crack there. So. What you're doing is that you're disrupting your system, your bonding of your masonry. You're disrupting this with a very weak, yeah, it's not even a frame, a, a very weak, al almost pre-cracked uh, columns and, and uh, that also are difficult to connect to, to the beams. So it's difficult to make. And like I said, I question um, whether it works or not. Okay. So to uh, wrap up this uh, literature review, uh, the search criteria, my conclusion is that basically everything is out that is out there is one size fits all and it doesn't make sense. One technique is not the other one, simple as that. The original sources, they're 40 years old, have never been updated. And when I looked at whatever is out there, there's no consensus on anything. So that means basically we can't use it, is my opinion. Right, I did the same for codes, building codes. I went to, through uh, 325 seismic and masonry codes of uh, almost 60 countries, all in original languages. So I had as many people helping me with the translations. We looked at this in the time frame of 100 years. Conclusion is basically the same as, as for, the, for the manuals. First of all, at this point, stone masonry is only allowed in seven, seven countries in the world. In the rest of the world, it is forbidden. Um, Georgia, by the way, uh, is, also, is going to change to Eurocode, so it's going to be six countries soon. That doesn't make sense at all. I mean, stone masonry is used a lot. I mean, I've already shown you um, that um, in, in, the, in the needs assessment that stone masonry is used a lot in the world. For example, in the north of Pakistan, uh, the whole country of Bhutan doesn't have building codes. Afghanistan, about 80% of that is stone. Turkey, but Turkey is, is completely forbidding it uh, uh, already, and so on and so on and so on. So by forbidding, you're basically ruling out a, a, a big uh, portion of your building stock. So that doesn't make sense. But the conclusion is the same, no consensus on any of the basic design specifications. So 
For example, in India, houses of two stories are allowed only up to 0.08 G, which is a very minor, low seismic uh, risk. If we compare this, for example, with Nepal, where the same two-story house with slightly different dimensions is allowed up to 0.40 G, which is a very high seismic risk. Again, I show you here the difference between those few countries. The differences are enormous. And if we look at schools, then, but, well, I put India and, and Nepal between brackets uh, because it's, it's not even clear if it is allowed or not. If you read the codes to the letter, it's not allowed. Schools are not allowed in, in, uh, in India and Nepal. But at the same time, the government in Nepal after the earthquake was promoting certain designs in stone masonry. So again, but the difference, look at the difference between what is allowed in Iran, just one, uh, one classroom versus a massive school in Tajikistan. So again, here, the difference between the countries is, is enormous. There's again, a massive imbalance between the information that is out there. So this is now where I come to my second conclusion is that we have completely lost the basics. And I think I've proven it uh, by now. To show you uh, uh, something from the Indian codes, uh, India has a, a code for non-engineers, uh, which is IS 13828. Um, but in there, it refers to many other codes, one for foundations, the, the National Seismic Code, um, a, a code of practice for earthquake resisting buildings, for unreinforced masonry, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, so these codes then, they have been, um, the amendments have been added, but then just at the beginning of the code, so you sort of need to fill it in yourself, but it's amendment over amendment, um, whereas sometimes you need to find your information in a, t in a footnote of a table where it refers, so and for example, something about vertical steel is here mentioned in a footnote that refers to a footnote of another table. Now, I just show you this very simple example, but the thing that I want to mention here is that we need to revise this because it has become unreadable. So the information is not only we need to go not only go back to the basics, but it needs to be clear. It needs to be needs to be up to date. So okay, that's what I wanted to say. This is why we lost the basics. All right, I want to show you something slightly different, um, which is the cost implications. Now, you may remember that I said, uh, I don't know, 15 minutes ago, I said, okay, um, one of the experts came up with the idea of removing one horizontal band. And if we have to remove, uh, if we, we potentially could save 1 million bands um, in the rebuilding of uh, rebuilding effort of Nepal. So the question is, what will it cost? And no one knows. So what we did, uh, we have been there in Nepal for about 10 years. So we collected all the, the costing data of 10 years. In Nepal, they work with district rates. So a district rate means that the, for the whole district, which is, which is like a complete, um, um, almost like a, like a state uh, on state level, um, the price of a bag cement uh, or the price of, of wood or the price of basically everything has been set by the government. But it also means that the bag of cement that uh, costs basically the same in the city of Pokhara, uh, but the price is also the same in this government rates, uh, let's say 4,000 meters high up the mountain, which doesn't make sense, of course, because to get that bag of cement there, we need to include transportation. Um, people need to carry these bags up to the hill. Um, so we had this local data. And uh, so we knew exactly in the whole region, uh, where is the, is the markets? Um, how far are these uh, schools? Uh, how high are these schools? Uh, what, what does it cost to bring all the materials there? Um, what we also did is uh, we looked at, uh, let's say, uh, the, the, the rivers itself. Some rivers have very good quality rough sand, which is good for concrete and mortars, um, while other uh, villages were close to a ri river with very fine sand. So fine sand is very good for plastering, but not so good for concrete and, and, and mortars. So what we had to do sometimes is that we had to uh, put a higher amount for transport in the estimate uh, if some village needed to get the good sand, sand from a different river. Um, some cases, uh, people have uh, community forests. Uh, in other cases, it had to be uh, uh, bought from different places. So we were able to make very specific local cost estimations. And with those estimations, we, I could exactly calculate the effects of a band. So 
normally again i do this uh, with the audience uh, live but um it's a bit difficult now to do this online so i'm going to just give you a few options the thing is this this is a fully completely reinforced school with five horizontal bands with cement mortar and so on the question now is what happens if we remove one of these beds? so let's remove the sill beam or let's remove two beams let's just see what happened what is the implications there uh usually i uh, we do a little bit of um of, uh, uh <laughs> yelling <laughs> like what do you think it is um but removing two bands. Uh, normally, the options are uh, okay. What will it? Uh, uh, what will it save of the of the total budget? Or maybe we we can try to do this. Put it in the chat. What do you think? What is the answer? What what percentage of the budget are we going to save if we remove two bands? What do you think? Is it more than thirty percent? Is it about between fifteen and thirty? Is it between five and fifteen? Or is it maybe less than five percent? Throw it in the chat, then I can take a sip of water. Sure, I guess the chat is disabled. Oh, sorry. Then I'm going to give the answer. Okay. But if the chat is disabled, no one can ask questions. All right. The most guessed answer is this. When I ask this question, and I've asked this all over the world, the most guessed question is uh, answer is between 15 and 30 percent but the answer is this it is just two percent so i have to admit that even i was a bit surprised by this i said okay how can it be this little so it means that one horizontal band a concrete band costs or in this system costs between one and a half and, and two percent uh, between one and a half uh, one to one and a half percent each and the thing that I overlooked myself is that, okay, if I remove a concrete band, then still what will come back here is a layer of stones with cement mortar. And the stones with the cement mortar cost almost the same as concrete. So I was very surprised. So I thought, okay, this is disappointing, right? Uh, we were hoping for massive cost savings, 1 million bands minus a lot of, uh, a lot of money, but it is actually super good news. The good news is, is that a horizontal band, which is one of the most important seismic features, doesn't cost so much. So there is no need to not put it in. It is actually very good news. That doesn't mean that we should, should try to, to throw in seven, but I mean, a band, a very important reinforcement is not that expensive. That's the good news. But I also looked at the total price. So let's say from doing what I did, which is uh, five bands, which is uh, improved roof, which is cement mortar versus doing nothing like the one that cracked uh, in the in the right uh, bottom uh, side. That is a completely unreinforced mud mortar building. A, a complete three classroom building at that point costs about nine lakh, which is, by the way, uh, a, a Nepalese rupee. Um, and a completely reinforced building, everything is about 16 like which at that point was about 20,000 US or maybe it's today but that doesn't matter the percentage is more important to build let's say um a reinforced school is about 83% more expensive than an unreinforced school that's the point now of course that is a lot of money i understand that i understand that for uh, for people in the, in the in the mountains that's a massive amount of money it's almost double the, the price but at the same time it's also the difference between collapse and and survive but here comes now a very interesting fact out of this let's say 83 percent uh 13 percent of that is improvement of mortar so let's say from mud to cement mortar and about 50 percent is throwing in all the bands so that's about 28 let's say 30 percent roughly that is the same amount as all the finishing and paintings so, for example, all this plastering and painting and all these uh, aprons here and this valence board that is just a bit of wood under the roof, things like that is almost the same amount as putting in mortar, cement mortar, and putting in all the horizontal bands. So the point I'm trying to make here is that instead of, if, you, if your budget is low, then wait with the finishing. The finishing you can do always later, but at least improve your building 
with better mortar and at least maybe one or two bends or all the bends, uh, in, depending on the seismic level. But that's my point. So the good thing is that the horizontal bends are not expensive. And this is this is unique information. No one had ever uh, researched this before because the data was simply not there. So it's not so expensive. Cement mortar, yes, that is expensive. But wait then with the finishing. Do that first, and then finishing can be postponed. So it's basically a matter of prioritization. That's what it's all about. OK, that was my fourth uh, point. Now, the last uh, thing that I uh, researched, uh, we did a base shear seismic demand comparison. I'm going to do this short, um, because this is the, the highly technical stuff. Um, what we did is we started looking at the building codes um, of, well, let's say Euro code, Nepal follows Euro code mostly, the Indian code, Chinese, uh, Russian code, Tajikistan in this case. Um, but also we looked at the US based code. So for example, Pakistan um, at that point uh, was looking at the uh, uniform building code. Afghanistan and Turkey look at sort of um, the ASCA 7 uh, codes. And we followed them literally. So what we then managed to do uh, in order to compare all these codes, we had to come up with a conceptual base share formula. I'm not going to go through all this in detail. Um, but for example, for India, what we could see is that uh, India has divided, um, uh, well, it was five, but it's now four seismic zones, zones two to five, with the highest zone um, is set at 0.36G. But because of their um, um, uh, immediately in, in the, um, uh, the PGA is, is divided by two. So in the design earthquake, the seismic risk is immediately divided by two. And if we compare this now with other countries, then what we can see is that if this is the Himalayan belt, then we see that, for example, Afghanistan calculates with quite high seismic risk, high PGA, and also then uh, the north of Pakistan, high PGA. But because India immediately chops it in, into two, all of a sudden we have sort of a gap here in, in the seismic risk, which is then again in Nepal quite high, and then here Sikkim, it's quite low again. And then Bhutan quite high, and India quite low. I'm just showing this um, as, as an example of how different countries uh, perceive different seismic risks. Uh, we looked then at um, the response spectra. Again, I'm not going to go into all this detail. We look into the vertical distribution. India, again, is doing something different with a parabolic uh, approach, which I believe doesn't make much sense for very small uh, little buildings. Um, we looked at this redistribution of forces. Long story short, the conclusion is this, is that seismic codes are basically written for uh, concrete and steel frame buildings. And what you see here then is that most of the seismic mass, uh, seismic weight is in the floors and there's less weight in the walls. But now if we look at our little, uh, little um, stone masonry buildings, it's the exact opposite. What we see here, it is uh, masonry shells with holes with basically, well, negligible diaphragms. The floor um, and, and, and the roof they weigh uh, about two to two and a half percent of the total um, of the total weight of the building. So let's say ninety eight percent of these buildings, the mass is in the walls. So this is the complete opposite from a frame building. So conclusion is is uh, and and also what we see here, by the way, is that in conventional lumping, uh, we we lose out too much of the seismic weight. For the school, it's almost half of the seismic weight, which is a lot with these heavy stone masonry buildings. So the conclusion is is that. The codes as they are, are not meant for stone masonry. They are meant for concrete and steel. And for that reason, we need to come up with something that is standalone, that is specifically for stone masonry. Now, if I now wrap this up, then I say, okay, what we need is, um, we need clear terminology, right? I was very clear that we said, we need to make a very clear distinction between stone types and masonry types, because we completely have lost the basics all the countries and all the manuals say something different. And for that reason, it is so important that we come up with some standalone codes, because I've also shown that a majority of the building stock, even also in India, the majority of building stock is basically non-engineered techniques or low-tech uh, rural uh, techniques. So we need to address this and we need to do it uh, quickly. So 
This was basically my PhD. But I want to come up with something that is far more important. I mean, my, my PhD is, is at some point was finished, it stopped, um, but it also continues, right? We are in the middle of something because we now need to solve this. But the only way that we can do it is that we first need to come up, and this is the most important word of today, we need to acknowledge this. We need to acknowledge that something is wrong. Because if we don't acknowledge that something is wrong, yeah, then we can just uh, move on, right? Then we can just ignore what is the situation and and and, and don't don't see the need to to change this. So acknowledgement is so important. I said a few years ago, I said, okay, enough is enough. It is not good enough. The majority of people live in these houses, but we still haven't figured it out. We still haven't given them something that they can use with confidence and that is reliable. Enough is enough. I'm not going any further with this. We need to address this. And I came up with an international call to action. And the international call to action is this. The first point is that the high tech seismic design, let's say concrete and steel, that is based on a lot of peer reviewed scientific research. The building codes are basically um, uh, relying on that peer reviewed um, knowledge. But for low tech seismic design, it is not based on any of that scientific research. It is based on what we call rule of thumb. And the, the, those are very outdated. I've shown that today. It's very outdated, it's contradictory, and it is incomplete. So it means it's not good enough. This we need to acknowledge. If we don't acknowledge that something is wrong, it will never change. So today is hopefully the point that I, some of you think, hey, wait a minute, this guy has a point. Something is wrong. And let's change that. That's where we are today. So I already moved on. I said, okay, we're going to try to figure this out. And um, But it has to go now through um, some levels of high-tech scientific research. It needs to go through these levels so that at least we as engineers have a better idea of how it works. And then we can bring it back to, the let's say, the level of the mason. Uh, then we can start uh, developing specific building codes for these low-tech uh, 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 low tech vernacular buildings in these seismic areas. So interestingly enough, I'm not the first one who is saying this because the pioneers of non-engineered basically already said the same in 1977. Professor Arya said that um, at that point, 1977, he said, okay, everything that we have today is empirically based and not theor theoretically derived. And over time, that needs to be uh, 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 reviewed and it needs to be improved uh, as more data becomes available. And it just didn't happen so far. So this is what I tried to do. And this is what we call SmartNet. The website is not uh, up yet, uh, but the SmartNet is, is basically our name, our project name, where we try to improve non-engineered techniques for the betterment of, of, well, the majority of people in the world, basically. So what we're doing today, and this is, by the way, where it becomes interesting for all of you who are looking for an interesting topic to work on for, uh, let's say, a thesis uh, or um, uh, academic research. So what we're doing today with 25 seismic masonry experts and, and students. And there's some top experts involved. Um, some top experts from Italy and Portugal, for example, are, are join, has joined our uh, project. So what we're doing, we're doing a full assessment of two case study buildings where I am going to do everything by hand. And some of our partners are doing this by computer modeling. And we need to figure out if that matches or not and, or how we can match it. And we do this on a global scale. So we follow the codes of Europe, of India, China, Russian codes, and, and uh, US codes. With this, we basically cover everything in the world. And this is our first case study building, our school. And this is a typical house in Nepal. And what we are doing is we're basically trying to verify everything possible. So we're doing out-of-plane uh, failure uh, verifications. Uh, by the way, we, uh, we know that this is not an issue because of the horizontal bands. But we have to do it. We just we will do it once. We do it. We do everything possible just to rule it out. That's one thing. But the issues are in the in-plane. And what we see and this and and now it becomes uh, yeah tricky because whatever is out there, 
the verifications that are out there is, is basically for unreinforced. But like I said, we have a fourth uh, category. We have what we call nominally reinforced or semi-reinforced. So what you see here is that when we do for unreinforced verifications, basically the general methodology that is out there, uh, our buildings cannot even withstand the lowest seismic force. Uh, it, it can't even, uh, we, we don't even um, uh, match uh, 0 0.04 G uh, at some of the panels. While at my buildings, we stood 0.35 G without, without any uh, crack at all. So this is what I mean is that there, there's a massive gap between uh, what, it's, what is possible on paper and, and what is uh, reality. So for that reason, again, we need to come up with something standalone specifically for our typology. So at the moment, we're doing a benchmark uh, exercise with these 25 experts so that we have the, the right material properties, so that we have the right um, uh, approaches in all the softwares. But the thing I already mentioned, the, the, the most difficult thing is material properties. Because, for example, for steel, we know exactly the material properties of steel and concrete, right? That has been researched for 100 years. It has been tested for 100 years. We know exactly what it is. But we don't know what this is. Um, there is quite a bit of data for stone masonry with lime mortar or lime-based mortars, but there is nothing for stone masonry with cement mortar. There's not so much for stone masonry with mud. And what we also need to do is we must make it local. So this is a picture I took in Indonesia. And what you see here is a person is mixing mortar. But I also took the picture 30 seconds before this, where he lost half of his cement. So you can imagine now that whatever he intended to mix is going to be weak. He wanted to maybe wanted to make 1s to 4, and it already became 1s to 8. But this is standard practice in many countries. This is Nepal. Uh, people bought a bag of cement. It already starts to prehydrate. Um, but yeah, people bought uh, this for 500 rupees, and they're not going to throw it away. So this cement is doing nothing anymore. They're going to crush it and going to throw it into the mix. And this is the result. Um, very badly uh, executed uh, concrete and mortars. Uh, this guy is plastering with his slipper and so on and so on and so on. So this somehow we must put into our uh, material properties. Uh, so what we uh, are doing is we have started a test campaign of low strength mortars that somehow uh, imitate, uh, um, uh, mimic local uh, construction uh, practice, let's say in the mountains of, uh, of Nepal or the rural areas of India. So it needs to be low strength mortars. This is some tests done uh, of, on masonry specimens in Patna uh, not so long ago. So this is initial outcomes. This, uh, so don't, uh, uh, th th this is not final at all, but what we can see uh, initial uh, outcome is that everything over four bands is not contributing uh, any much more to the building. And this is an initial outcome from uh, Nepal, uh, from uh, our, our partners in Kathmandu that said that the vertical steel is basically not doing much extra. Again, this is initial outcomes. Um, we have to refine this over the next few years. But in the end, this is what we need. So we have to go through all this high-tech um, uh, research, um, but at the same time, uh, we need to bring it back to the level of these guys because they only need to know it needs to be 40 centimeters thick and, and a meter long and whatever. Uh, they're not interested in all this modeling and, 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 and complicated stuff. So this is SmartNet. SmartNet is about finding uh, solutions, validating of techniques that are needed for the majority uh, of this world population. So acknowledgement, that's the key word. Acknowledgement means that we say, okay, enough is enough. And now we're going to solve this thing. And this is, of course, where I need your help as well, right? This is where you can join. So Acknowledgement is one th is, is two things. One is, uh, okay, something is wrong technologically, but there's a second thing I want to show you about acknowledgement, and that is that we need to do this also for the environment. So if we want to meet the sustainable development goals, um, we need to uh, acknowledge that something is very wrong here as well, because the, the, the global um, CO2 emissions um, is by, let's say, almost 50% of that is caused by the construction industry. And this is where you are in, right? You, are, you and me, we are in 
building and construction. If we look at materials, then 23% of the global CO2 emissions uh, is caused by the production of concrete, steel, and aluminum. So if we start promoting natural materials, like I do with stone, but also with earth and, and, and wood and things like that, hopefully we can contribute to a re reduction of the CO2. And just to show you how bad it is, but this is an, 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 a satellite picture of, um, of, of India. Um, what you see here is, is, is purely um, air pollution. So also for your uh, direct environment, it is very important that we start reducing steel and concrete and that we start uh, uh, promoting net natural materials. So acknowledgement is two things. It is the technological strategy where we try to well validate the, the techniques like I've shown you uh, in the beginning of uh, this, this presentation, but it is also an environmental strategy, right? We need to acknowledge that the world is not in the best shape. And if we want to have a cleaner world for our, for our children, we need to acknowledge that something is wrong and we need to address it. That's the thing. So this is also why I promote my techniques. So I talked a lot about stone, but I shown you also my school in the beginning, which is done with stabilized earth blocks. I mean, this is a really good technique that will reduce a lot of concrete and steel. In a seismic zone, yes, you will need some bands, but even here you can make uh, the bands with, with special blocks, which were uh, act as formwork. Um, and then the, the last thing is that it needs design. So this is the same block. It's the same technique, but it is done with a pro by proper architect in a way that you say, hey, wait a minute, this looks good, right? This is uh, something that, that I want to live in. This is also, this is in Colombia, which is also highly seismic zone. So I hope, I assume that they did something uh, seismic uh, to make it earthquake resistant. But the point is this, we need to promote nature-based solutions, natural materials, traditional techniques, but it needs to look modern. So something that worked in the past, which is strong, which is healthy, but looks like something that we all want to live in. That's the way we should go uh, if we want to promote this. So the same should apply for Ram the Earth, right? Traditional technique. Um, the same is for Batar, uh, dry stone masonry with wooden uh, bands. They behaved very, very well in the Kashmir earthquake in 2005. But it is something that is that looks for the poor, right? So it needs better uh, design. That's it. Um, this is a, a stone house in Slovenia, uh, which has to follow certain seismic uh, improvements. So it's a matter of design. So we can do it. That's my point. We can do it, but it needs to look acceptable. It needs to look nice. Because we know that these techniques work well, but now it's up to us to promote it in terms of safety, healthy, and it should look very nice. Same with uh, alternative techniques. This, These, um, let's say, super adobe houses, which is uh, filled bags with earth, they behaved quite well in uh, Kathmandu. There were a few there that survived the earthquake with just some uh, plaster damage. Or one step further, look at alternatives. Look at, for example, building with bottles, um, which can be made earthquake resistant, and then it's a matter of design. I'm just showing this very quickly, um, that we have a very important role to play uh, in reducing um, polluting materials. The last example uh, I want to show you is something that you also have a lot in India, is straw. And straw is a waste material. It is an agricultural waste material, but it is flexible. So in an earthquake, it works very well. But this is a picture, again, of, of, um, of India after the harvest. So this is purely smoke from burning crops. And burning crops uh, has a global CO2 emission of 3.5% every year. So I say, you have it. Don't um, burn it but use it, and then again, it's a matter of design. Make it look acceptable. So acknowledgement, that's the word of today. And acknowledgement means um, with well, my call to action that we must do something. We must acknowledge something is wrong, and then we must do something, but you must take action. That's, what I, that's my message today, and this is where you can join. The SmartNet. I think uh, I'm going to go to my very last slide. Um, which is, um, okay, this is where you can reach, reach out to us. Uh, so for any questions, um, 
this is the, the email. We are also on Facebook and Instagram. But the announcement I want to make now is this, is that what we are going to do in May and June um, is that we are going to do an online student workshop. There's only limited places. We're, there's 50 students maximum, but it is free. The only thing is this, uh, and this is the dates that we're probably going to do it, uh, May 13, 2027 and June 3rd. It's going to be four half days. So in your case, it's going to be afternoon. If you are interested in this, send us an email. Like I said, there's only 50 students that, uh, that are allowed. So you have to convince us <laughs> why you, uh, you want to, uh, to be part of this workshop. So if you're interested, send, send me an email today uh, or straight away so that we will send you the, uh, the registration and announcements, which we start next week. All right, um, this is the story I had. Um, time for coffee. But first, maybe a round of questions. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Mark. Hello. Let's see. Where do I unshare? Stop. So, and now I can see you again. So, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It was a great uh, webinar for all of us. The points that you highlighted and the points that you taught us was really amazing. Uh, the insight of our Indian census that you gave and the number of structures that are in Himalayan builds, which are built with masonry structures, and how important it is for us as uh, from an Indian point of uh, from an Indian context to understand not only how stones and masonry structures work. And to define, like we have already previous design techniques, but how important it is for us at this stage to go ahead, redevelop or re-innovate uh, our structures with regarding with what is currently required, as we can see with what happened in Turkey with the earthquake and Himalayan areas being really seismic active, how important it is for us to really go ahead, understand this topic, not uh, our stones, our cement bond and working ahead with reinforcement and how to really apply it. Thank you, sir. It was a great insight. Now, uh, I would like uh, now I would like Dr. Praveen to please read out the questions if, uh, in from the chat box. So over to you. I can't hear you, uh, Praveen. So you are not audible. Uh, no. There are questions. Uh, uh, Ma'am, I have also asked one question. Is it audible now? now I hear you. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now you're audible. I think there is some topic. So you're mute. So you're on mute. Now it's uh, fallen off the uh, earth. <laughs> okay. Well, let, let's do like this. Who, who, what, does anyone want to uh, ask a question? Yes, I please. Somebody. I Go I'd ahead. like to ask a question. Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Martin. It was a lovely presentation. Um, I'm a practicing structural engineer. I work for a company called Miyamoto International, which was also in yep. Nepal. Yes, I know them. Uh, it was amazing. I mean, there's tremendous knowledge I gained. Uh, if I may just share my screen briefly, uh, yes. you emphasized in your presentation that you uh, would rather do without vertical reinforcement or yes. vertical strips. Now, from what I understand is that when you have out of plane forces, the bands would transfer the horizontal out of plane load through shear or flexor from the bands, right? Yes. I mean, it, it goes from the band to the column and eventually to the foundation. But then in your slides, uh, you mentioned that you do not want that. You have, say, one rebar or two layers of rebar. I wanted to understand how is this 
getting transferred, are you relying on, say, uh, you know, this yeah. is to brick path uh, above the band, it transfers the horizontal load to the band and then from the band back to the wall beneath? Well, it's more, it's, so we're in the middle of this uh, sort of research now to prove it, because what you show um, in the top is columns, like four columns in the, that's completely different already. Um, I, I would not go with columns to begin with in this. Okay, let me be very clear. There's a distinction between the two types of, of, uh, of, of wall, uh, let's say thin walls, so uh, bricks up to maybe 20 centimeters. There, I would say, yes, the steel is definitely doing something. The vertical steel is definitely doing something. And it is also possible to, uh, to include that. I mean, in that case, what you can do is that you can make your you you can place your bricks in such a way that you that you create a cavity and around the cavity you can uh, cast um, some lean concrete so that that can work but in the very thick walls then the question is first of all that that vertical steel bar we're talking not about columns but we're talking about one vertical steel bar what will it do probably not so much it's it's not going to uh, create sufficient um, uh, ductility within that super heavy thick wall. That's one thing, and it's probably uh, disrupting my system when I try to make some overlap in the stones there. So, but that's what we try to prove. The thing with the horizontal bands when we do it at let's say three, four, or five levels, is that what we can all already see um, is that it is creating the same uh, stiffness as a um, as a, a stiff diaphragm. So out of plane bending or out of plane, uh, uh, so buckling or toppling, either one we are not afraid of at all due to the bands, because it is sort of a, a combined system now of these horizontal bands combined with, with very stiff masonry. So it is a super stiff building. Um, and we, we were pretty certain that we don't need that vertical steel there. That's basically what happens. I see. Well. Thank you for uh, answering my question. Bear, bear, bear with us for, let's say, one or two more years, and then we're going to publish this uh, with all the scientific backup. But okay. um, we, we are the vertical steel, we're fairly certain it doesn't uh, contribute at all. But what I also had in my first schools was buttresses. And um, I, I can imagine that the buttresses ha had a very clear function in, let's say, the, the stone masonry with mud mortar. And I can even imagine that if there would have been proper bonding in the walls, even with mud mortar, you you, you probably can withstand a certain uh, seismic force. And then the buttresses are doing a lot. But because we have now moved to uh, very clear proper bonding with horizontal bands in cement mortar, I also think that the, the, the buttresses are not needed in this particular system. That's also one of the things that we try to prove. But like I said, bear with us. Um, because it takes a bit. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, one last question is yes. that this band eventually transfers all the lateral load to the wall below, right? Yeah. So essentially you are relying on the wall below. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. Well, you. And, and what you say, that, you see, there's also friction there for sure, right? Yeah. Um, th th there, there, is, there is some locking mechanism um, um, in these walls, because the, the the layer of stones is not completely flat, right? That there's the, the it, it's um uh, what is the word? Um, what we also do sometimes is that we do uh, shards of stone. We let them sort of stick out. So where you have your mouse now, if you go slightly lower, yeah, yeah. Let's say that between the band and itself. So under the band, slightly right. lower. Yeah, there. Yeah. And there we sort of have some shards of stone sticking out so that there's more locking between the beam uh, and, and the masonry below. The thing is also that we, um, we have uh, basically never seen sliding failure. Uh, shear, so um, I see. Yeah, something like that. We, we have never seen sliding failure, for example, um, in, these, uh, in the walls, not even in unreinforced because, um, or hardly in unreinforced um, because of the rough surface of the stones. So the, the, the sliding failure is basically, um, it, it's also not an issue. It's usually diagonal shear uh, uh, failure. But anyway, all these things, um, like I said, it, it, 
uh, sort of <laughs> we lost the basics and we are bringing try to bring back these basics um in a full package of fully researched fully validated um case studies that uh, hopefully we have it in, within one or two years uh, we have some very clear answers here i need to say one last thing about it is that at that point there will be shake table ready so to speak so okay. we, we 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 will also at some point need to do some shake table testing, but we're we're only going to do that before we went through this uh, this first um, initial research to figure out is it for example five four or three bands, uh, and do we really feel that the vertical steel should not be there? If we have that conclusion, then we have sort of an optimized uh, scenario, and then then we'll start saving a lot of money for shake table tests. Okay, all right. Well, thank you so much for answering my question. Yeah, most welcome. By the way, um, if, if Miyamoto, uh, I, 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 I've, I have been in contact with Kit, um, but that's a few years ago. But if okay. you feel that there, there's scope to do something together, please reach out to him again. He, he might remember my name. Certainly. Um, yeah, let, let's see what we can do. I mean, that's basically what I'm also trying to do. This is why we do these sessions like today. I mean... One thing is to reach out to students who are looking for thesis subjects um, that we say, hey, there's so much to do. Um, go ahead and with, we, we can uh, show you sort of the way how we do it and, and you might be able to follow up. Could be for stone, could be for earth, could be for wood, could be for whatever. Uh, but we also try to um, yeah, make connections with, of course, people in the field like yourselves. Um, so yeah. I am very Let's, enthusiastic uh, about this, and I am going to write a mail to Kit right away after this session. Yeah, uh, send me an email as well so that we are also connected. Certainly, sir. We'll do that. Oh, Thank you. Sounds good. Sounds good. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Kostur, for your question. I think my voice is audible now. Yes. Okay, Martin. Thank you. Um, there is one question from the student participant uh, which says that, as you have mentioned, that there are several limitations in the guidelines, then which document one needs to follow to construct the seismically efficient stone masonry buildings? Because there are several issues and which you have already pointed out in your presentation. The answer is none of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yeah, no, you see, that's that's a tough one because um, you see, something is wrong. That's for sure. And like this very super key question, like the vertical steel, should it be there? Yes or no? Like where I say no, but at this point, most of the manuals say yes, and even the two building codes say yes. But like I said, that has not been um, uh, adjusted in the last forty years. And I think I make some strong cases why it should not be there. The only thing is missing is the proof. I mean, I can say whatever I want, but I need to prove it. And then the next problem is, is that at some point we will come with our guidelines, with our answer, and we're going to put it on top of that very big pile of misinformation. So who is going to believe us, right? But anyway, uh, it, it's going to be an easier story for us to convince people when we have this big layer a big pile of scientific proof so at this point yeah what to use <laughs> that's a tough one uh yeah there's not you, you can basically only use what's there but yeah I, I don't like it i don't like those rules at all um right the the, the that 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 example that i've shown of those safe seven layers that happened now in nepal mm, mm which is also based on nothing. Uh, it's actually probably worse than better. Mm -hmm. So bear with us for a little bit right. before we have hopefully the better answers. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have correctly pointed out that there were several errors and mistakes uh, in the several recommendations, guidelines, even in these standards that have been carried forward for a very long time. And because of that, the practicing engineers uh, are facing a lot of difficulty that which document one should go for, which one is correct, which one is not. So yeah, uh, yeah. And that's yes. that and that's that's an issue. And that's why we try to address this and solve this. Address that issue. Okay. Yeah, we have I mean, to. And, and this yes. is why I also say it's so important that we have standalone codes mm -hmm. and not like this one size fits all codes. I mean brick masonry. So uh, I let's say the IS. A, uh, 18382 um 
standards uh, code of practice for non-engineer techniques, whatever it's called in India, has a massive, massive chapter on masonry, a super small chapter on stone, and that stone oh. chapter keeps referring to the masonry and to foundation and to another code and to a footnote in a footnote in another code. Unreadable. Unreadable. So you're referring to 13828, right? Dr. For example, for example, yes, yeah, right, that's uh, right. basically so, in India. That's at this point is the code is the, is the is the valid code, but it is a complete mess. Okay, okay. <laughs> is my opinion. So, yeah, we'll move uh, to a few more questions. Uh, one of the participants asked why the masonry buildings are considered as non-engineered construction. Not necessarily non-engineered. Well, okay. This we need to clarify a little bit as well. There is a, a, one thing is unreinforced, uh, which is usually the case uh, because people don't know what to do or it's too expensive or it's done wrongly or whatever. Unreinforced, but it can be like normal brick masonry as well. Right. But then still, if you would do this, let's say in a city, then hopefully an engineer has looked at it, hmm. whether it's done properly or not. That's but if you go to the mountains of Nepal, there is no engineer there at all. None. Right. This is why we call it, this is why I call it non-engineered. Non-engineered. Um, because non-engineered literally means that the mason learned from his father and that mason learned from his father. Right. No so engineer they are not involved. the skilled, the skillness of a particular mason was completely missing. Right, the quality no, 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 of work. No, 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 no. Again, it's more delicate like this. It could be a super good mason. Okay. Right. And a super good mason, he knows that he must put in all these true stones and all these connections. Right. Because the thing is, let's take let's take the example of Batar. Batar is let me maybe I'll show you the picture. One more time. Because that's that's a very good case. Batar is this one. Okay. So where it, be, where it becomes interesting is that this is non-engineered because no engineer ever, ever was involved in this. But it okay. is based on two, two, three, four, five hundred years of experience. And these buildings behave much better in the Kashmir earthquake in 2005. They behave okay. much, much, much better than all the concrete block buildings because there's thousands of them collapsed. And these were all standing but they don't look so nice. They look like, like this, right? They look like this. This is what we say, oh, this is for the poor. This is, I don't want this. This looks very much for poor people and I'm, I want to live in concrete. But the thing is that this one survives an, will survive an earthquake. And if you put a concrete house next to this, that might collapse. So I'm saying here is that the, the differences between, and this is also, by the way, non-engineered, but it is based on 500 years or maybe 1,000 years of, of not, local knowledge. And if a, and a good mason knows this, and this is now the, the problem because the good masons are disappearing. <laughs> um, the craftsmanship is disappearing. Right. But so th there's different terminology. Um, okay. This is, by the way, not unreinforced masonry. This is this is a, cer a certain uh, play between the wood frame and the and the stone infill, um, but 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 it, it it would be sort of qualified under un unreinforced because there is no other options here. <laughs> it's unreinforced, or reinforced, or confined. Hmm. This is different. This is why I mean we need standalone codes. Right. Uh, anyway, the next question. Yes. Yes. The next question is you talked about in the reinforced masonry. There is a provision of horizontal reinforcement as well as vertical reinforcement, right? And you also mentioned that in especially the vertical providing the vertical reinforcement may not be that efficient from the seismic point of view. But the question is, which one is more efficient then? So shall one needs to go for a horizontal reinforcement in order to prevent the in-plane uh, forces? Or the combination of horizontal and vertical reinforcement, which will be rather better to prevent the seismic action. Again, that depends on the, on the technique, right? Um, let me go back to this beginning, one in the beginning here. Here, here it is definitely doing something. Hmm. Absolutely. 
in the thinner walls, it is a combination of something vertical, something horizontal. But here it is very easy to implement. It is very easy to, to incorporate. Here it isn't. And here we question it. So here, but the horizontal bands, I think in the end are, are, are probably, well, okay, no, no, let me not say that. I think here it is the combination of both. And here it is very certain the horizontal bands that, that is doing both. It's, it's presenting out of plane failure for sure because of the, 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 the box behavior that you create, but also the in-plane. I mean, it's basically, you get strips of masonry um, so so the, the the height is reduced um so it's basically sort of breakers of of, of diagonal cracking um anyway bear with us a little bit longer and then we give you the exact answer how this works um but like i said i I've, i i have no doubt here i mean um look look at what we had this this is this is it this is by the way with vertical steel but um mm. This school zero cracks and probably subjected to about 0.35 g. So, um, and and even this is questionable. I, this this is our old old style of gable. I don't the do this again. We, we, we now do a light roof, um, but it's still this one behaves very well. So um, yeah. the bands are certain. I'm certain uh, that uh, they work. Here we had also buttresses. I think we can do without. But anyway. Uh, this, mm. Like I said, this is all part of our uh, research now. We want to validate and optimize and so on and so on and so on. Um, one participant uh, has commented that, as you have mentioned that in seismic codes, many of the clauses were very confusing, right? So yes. if the information in the seismic code is not changed, Right. If you see IS-1905, it was lastly published in the year 1984. So it's been almost more than 30 years. There is yeah. no modification. So then how come the structural engineers deal with such kind of a problems? So that was the comment made by well, one of the parties. Yeah. And it is a, <laughs> we come back to the same thing. I mean, yes. these things, yeah, these things need to be updated for sure. Update. The right. thing, what I don't understand um, is that, um, let's go back to this slide. That, that says a lot. Uh, this one. All right. So, this is, uh, let's say, 10, 15 years ago. India rural uh, building stock. I, I'm going to be, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, what happens in the next uh, census. Uh, but okay, what we see here, that is about 3% at that point, 15 years ago, 3% in rural areas was, let's say, concrete and steel, meaning that 95%, more than 95% was right. masonry or a type of masonry or a type of natural materials. But we cannot find <laughs> sometimes one student that wants to work on masonry. Uh, all the students want to work on concrete and steel. So let's say 99% of the students want to work on 3% of the building stock. Th that doesn't make sense. So that, that imbalance somehow also needs to be addressed. Right. And this is maybe one of the reasons why, yeah, I don't know, masonry is not, so everybody builds with masonry, but no one wants to sort of work on it. Maybe that's why the building codes uh, are not addressing this and have not been revised properly, but they should be revised very properly. Um, like you said, it's 30 years old or maybe longer. Um, I, I think it's from 1980 something. Uh, 1984, yeah, it, yeah, it, it yeah, will whatever. be almost yeah. four decades now. Yeah, so you you should demand <laughs> that it is updated, because it doesn't it doesn't match the need in the country. The need in the country is that you need proper guidelines for uh, for masonry, or let's say confined masonry for that yes, matter. Yes, yes, the confined masonry already yeah. the code is in drop stage. Maybe most probably next year by the end of next year. That's true. That's true. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah, that's it, it will be coming. Yes. Yeah. But as far but, yeah. as Certification of uh, the IS-1905 is concerned, it is a little doubtful whether the code yeah. is going to be updated or not. It, it, it should, it, it, it's outdated for sure. Um, hmm. Well, we looked at it at both okay. and we know that it's super outdated. Um, yeah. 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 And Martin, that's why we do this work. Okay. Let's move to a few more questions. 
uh, the question is what is the recommendation for the mortar to be used in stone masonry construction is there any specific recommendation which type almost. of mortar one should go for well almost the, the thing is uh, uh, i think uh, the the code says one is to six uh, we believe that's not strong enough hmm. um i think the 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 latest national building code says something one is to four for high seismic zones yes uh, it's probably, two and five. Hmm. i would i would go for one is to four anyway um yeah. for the simple reason that um in the end it's going to be weaker anyway um and i'm just going to show you again this picture right this guy that mixed uh, mixed mortar uh but lost half of his cement and and right, and, 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 right all the so um i would go always with one is to four um and, and then hopefully that, that then you're closer to one is to four because if you say one is to six it's going to be one is to eight easily uh, already anyway that's uh, that's the reality and uh, in one of the slide you have uh, commented that in stone masonry building the shear sliding usually not occurs why is yeah. it so well let me because you don't have a a, a, a very straight straight joint shear. yeah you don't have a straight shear plane so to speak plane. Um, right right let's let's show it here in a picture because we are using random rubble kind of a mason yeah so exactly have... so here let's zoom in here you, you see what well, it, yes, it's, it's quite clear to see here, but you see, you don't, if this would be cement mortar, you see, you don't have a, a, the very straight lines here. Like right. in bricks, it's very straight lines, right? Here right. also, it's, it's very rough, edged. So that's why uh, um, shear failure is not, uh, is not likely to happen. It doesn't happen, basically. It, it will always be shear cracking first. Mm -hmm. Or in this case, dislodging of the... Of, of the connection between the between the two uh, orthogonal walls and so on. So that that the first figure is basically corresponding to a corner failure, right? Where the yeah. main wall and yeah. the cross wall they basically yeah. separated from each other. Yeah. 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 Uh, the next question was: What are the seismic deficiencies? Do you see uh, that need to be addressed, especially in stone masonry construction? What are the different seismic deficiencies from your well, own experience in with respect to stone mason reconstruction? Yeah, basically what you see here, right? Mm. This is this is a major one, which could be this, this is why you have these beams, right? Th right. This will hold uh, together these these corners. Or uh, diagonal shear cracking, uh, sliding failure is not really an issue. Um or bulging of the walls, which is uh, what we see. Mm here um, very clearly uh, so yes that right the one. Yes. this one this one should have been in this direction uh all right. that loose stuff um this is a very weak the mud mortar which is very brittle but i want to, this one you can see it here very clearly as well is that again this is this is three walls right stones here and stones here what they did here is they used river boulders round boulders so they're already mm. being you see that this is bulging it's right. by all almost by gravity it's already being pushed out uh and this is why you then get this lodging of these two whites uh so th th that's the the most common uh, deficiencies in these uh, in these buildings all right so the next question is related to that bulging only uh, dr martin uh one participant says in multi-leaf masonry walls where there are uh, multiple leaves present in the stone mason reconstruction, how to prevent splitting and what are the measures taken to have a proper bond between the wall whites? Well, the answer is already given against the splitting. Through stone, so this, yes. Through stones. Uh, there, there is some rule of thumb here as well, which at some point we, we will try to sort of validate, but let's say every uh, 90 centimeters. So, okay. uh, so here you would have as here you would have one like this, and in this direction on the layer on top and on this. So alternating uh, from from top to bottom, and then uh, let's say every sixty to ninety centimeters, uh, but also uh, in height. So um, let me think, where can we see it? Uh, here, something like this. Hmm. 
happens. So, so th this makes sense, but you can already see here the conflict, right? With <laughs> it doesn't right. even fit right. these two things. Right. Anyway, mm -hmm. but that's uh, that's the idea. Okay. But the, here the point is, let's say when the wall thickness is very high, let's say 700 to 900 mm, in that yeah. case, getting the through stones of that length or width may be a little difficult task. So what are the yeah. other ways uh, that can be used where the why, through stones are not available? Yeah. Why go with such thick walls? I mean, first no, of all, I think with stone, you shouldn't go higher than two story. And no, then um, but let's say let's say there are few structures which are of national importance or some of the heritage structures where the wall thickness is very, very high, yeah. especially the existing masonry construction. Yeah. Then so, then we're talking about a different, different uh different person, di yes. A, a retrofit and 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 that and, and things like that. That's different. Um, okay. I, so whatever I've shown you today does it is, uh, with respect to the new new stone yeah. masonry construction. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the next... retrofit is a different uh, different sport. Okay. Uh, the next question is: um, in majority of the cases, it has been observed that the vertical elements, that is your masonry walls, are not properly anchored with the horizontal elements that is your diaphragms how to yes. address this issue well uh, that is of course something that we also will be working on but you can already see it here let's see mm. here where are we no wait The thing is that uh, in this particular case, we have already seen that the, the weight of the of the walls is 98%. And mm -hmm. in this case, for example, you can see that what they do here is that they start putting the first beam on this wall and then it goes on this wall. It's not even connected to the side walls. But what we have seen in our initial conclusions is that because of all these beams, um, it, it, there's there's no risk of um, of out of plane failure. Um, the, the whole building is so stiff that it starts to work as one little block, and the effect of these diaphragms in this case is 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 basically nothing, almost nothing. Um, so you mean to so, say that since the RC bands are provided, you yeah. are breaking the complete height into two different zones. So the unsupported height has been reduced, right? Um, because of the banks yeah it's still well actually you get a double height um, but mm. these buildings are so stiff um, that, that it's not an issue but I already saying I, I'm I doubt that we should go higher than two story um, and, and, and this is probably in very limited um, dimension but what I'm saying here is that basically you, you should be able in the, that's what we think is that you should be able to treat this as a, a very st stiff shell without diaphragms. And uh, it, the diaphragms are there, but it, they're not critical. That's what we think. But again, th this needs a little bit of more um, validation. Yeah, because there is another important point is that during the reconnaissance survey after any earthquake, even in uh, Turkey and Syria, what happened recently, it has been observed that many of the out of plane failure of masonry walls that has occurred when there was a sloping roof, right? And especially the first story walls, masonry walls are mostly failed in out of plane because of the uh, uh, improper anchorage between the horizontal element and the vertical element, wall yeah. as well as the roof. So that was the question actually how yeah, to yeah. anchor this? In but order then, to prevent then, the failures. But then I, I think we're talking about unreinforced masonry. Unreinforced, and, yes. Yeah. Right. And and that and that and unreinforced masonry in seismic areas should be forbidden or is forbidden basically. It's basically everywhere not permitted. This is why we yes. then add these horizontal bands and improved uh, um, um, uh, masonry pattern and improved mortar. And those three things together likely will make up for bad anchoring of the roof. If you anchor the roof properly, it might contribute, yes, of course, but still 
that roof in this case only weighs about two two percent of the total mass so it's it's really not going to do much if you really want to uh, improve this uh, in terms of let's say stiffness then you should make a, a concrete slab or a, a stiff diaphragm but then the risk is that someone is going to build another story on this which you may maybe don't want to have uh, but yeah of course but the the, the weight will increase a bit uh, well a bit with uh, almost uh, what was it 18 percent i believe i calculated that once um then all of a sudden the, the diaphragms are 18 percent of the total mass um for the stiffness it's good but what we see in our initial conclusions is is that it's not necessary there's plenty stiffness uh provided by these horizontal bands right provided they're of good good uh quality so but like i said um we're in the middle of this um we'll uh we'll come with some results soon right and as you have correctly pointed out that in some of the countries, the unreinforced masonry construction is totally forbidden. For example, New Zealand, they clearly say that no masonry, unreinforced masonry construction is allowed in any part of the country. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And so, uh, yes. Uh, next question, Martin, is that since the density of the stone masonry is very high and these stone masonry units are very heavy in weight, so the question is, what is the consistency of the mortar uh, that one need to use so that it won't be squeezed out of the layer placed between the stones as the weight of the stone is very high? I hope you are able to get my question because yeah, they say they, because they say they, that there is one layer of a stone. They place a yeah, one yeah, layer yeah. of a stone. I understand the question. When you, yeah, when they place, it squeezes out. I, I'm I'm not so worried about that, um, to be honest. Uh, we have never seen that <laughs> during construction. No, but the, 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 I would always go with one as to four. Um, one as to four. And, and okay. it needs to be cured, and it needs to be cured properly. So it means uh, that you need to keep and the walls is there, wet. Is there is there any specific water cement ratio that uh, you want to recommend that one need to follow, especially during the inside construction? Well, but now we're going to non-engineered, right? So this is mixed on the spot. On the uh, spot. Okay. So what we did in the mountains is that um, we did training, and then we were teaching. Uh, we introduced, for example, these these boxes, these measuring boxes. Uh, let's see, these. Yeah, yeah, this one, the wave volume match. Yeah. So what we did is we we mixed by volume, and that means that this uh, box had the volume of one bag of cement. And then if you do one is to four, you just empty one bag of cement oh, and you oh, fill yes, full, and put four boxes like of cement. Yeah. Mm. And then we have mixed by volume. But then what we also did, we did uh, we did uh, some training on the in the um, uh, we did field training that it should not be too wet. So they, they oh, needed, right. so we did a sort of very simple slump test just with a with a plastic cup, just showing them that if you do too much water, it that there's basically no consistency. They needed to learn that, um, how to, and, and a good mason knows. You see, this right, is the difference right. between an experienced mason and a not so good mason. And, uh, um, but yeah, so it's not like we're uh, measuring water. It, it's it's hmm. done okay. by experience. And uh, the next question is, uh, in one of your slides, you have shown the RC bands at the different levels of the building, right? Yeah. One at the roof level, one at the lintel level. The question is, how many RC bands are necessary to achieve the proper integral box action to improve the seismic response? Whether yes. one is sufficient or we need more? Well, th that depends on the seismic risk to begin with. But let's say we built in high risk. Uh, so we did five. One you can't see. The one is the one here on the... Plinth, um, at the plinth band. The plinth, yeah. Plinth. So one, two, three, four, five. Again, this we do differently. We do now with a light roof. But these five, we, we did as this was basically the rule of thumb. That we followed the rule of thumb. Um, it looks like we can do with four. But again, um, allow us some time to, to prove that for the highest zones. Um, we are not 100% sure about the stitches, if they're needed or not. But again, we'll, we'll come with that. If you are in a in a let's say a, a low seismic zone, 
then probably one is enough, which is uh, one on the top. But then I would recommend to uh, to play to 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 uh, have the openings up to that point as well. Um, but again, um, allow us some time. Okay, to, uh, um, but in the Martin, I agree. Yeah. But in the figure, we can see that there are only three bands which right. are continuous throughout the perimeter of the building. One is the yep. pent band, another yep. is the at the lintel level, another is at yep. the roof level. Yep. What is Correct. the significance of the band at sill level and at the intermediate uh, level which we have provided? These are discontinued ones, not yep. throughout. So yep. what's the use of it? I, and, and that's exactly one of the questions that we will try to answer <laughs> soon. Um, the, I'm, 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 I'm quite, conf you see, if you would look at a diagonal shear cracking, then this zone here in the middle is, is critical. Mm -hmm. And so th that stitch, um, I what we did ourselves is we at some point we, we continued it anyway, and especially with the cement block buildings. Um, I, I can imagine that, that maybe in this higher region, it's doing more than at this level. Because the lower you go into the building, the, basically the less uh, lateral force um, uh, you get, you have. But the thing is um, that uh, do I say that correctly? Anyway, the the thing is that this one is semi continuous, so it's only punctured by one door. That's it. So we believe that it's still playing a quite in terms of uh, let's say uh, con the the continuous. Um, so uh, if I have correctly understood uh, your point, the point which you're trying to make is these intermediate bands, which are not continuous throughout, but they will help in reducing the propagation of cracks, the diagonal yeah. cracks. That, that's, that's the idea. Okay. But like I said, we, we are now at this, this stage trying to figure out the, the exact effects of this. Okay. Uh, the last question of the day, Martin, uh, and the question is what methods we need to adopt for implementing affordable but reliable strengthening methods? He's talking about the retrofitting methods on existing URM structure. Any idea which you want to uh, highlight? Uh, no. <laughs> Okay. No, no um, it, that's simply not my expertise. Uh, I, I know, of course, that there, there's many, uh, there's a lot of research happening uh, on this, um, especially, for example, in Italy, uh, there's so many research happening there in Portugal on uh, retrofit. Uh, but it is a different uh, different approach. It's completely different. Uh, uh, it's not, well, yeah, quite different from, let's say, building new uh, buildings. So let, I'm not going to answer this because I'm, I know there's plenty of research happening. Mm. Right. But it's not my expertise, so I I, I okay. can't really fully answer this. Um, but there's plenty no, I, I totally, uh, plenty I, information. I totally, about it. I totally agree with you, Martin. Um, I think this question is asked because uh, if you see even from the Indian perspective, India 60 to 70 percent of land mass is in seismic zone three, four, and five, and more than 85 percent of existing housing stock is uh, masonry structures. Right? It consists of brick, stone, adobe. And only 10% is corresponding to concrete and 5% to steel structures, which you have already very clearly highlighted with all the building statistics uh, by giving the references of building census also across the different countries of the globe. So uh, this is the another area, like how to safeguard the existing structures. So I think yeah, that yeah, question... Yeah. No, no, it's it's a good question, but but I I simply it's not my uh, okay. my my expertise, so I better not say too much about that. Okay, okay, thank you so much, Martin. I think Welcome. that's it Welcome. for the day. Yeah. We have. Can I can I can I repeat one more thing for the? Yeah, sure, for sure. The, uh, absolutely. For those yeah, for those participants who want to know anything, have questions, always send me an email. But also, if you are interested in participating in that uh, in that workshop that we're doing um, in May and June, send us an email so that we can send you uh, when we start the registration. Sure, sure, definitely. Okay, over to Shamroi. Thank you, sir. Um, 
I also want to thank all the attendees for making this event such a great success. I hope the discussion clarifies most of your queries. Now, I would like to call upon Ms. Minarvi Anupam to address the vote of thanks. Uh, namaste, everyone. Uh, I am Minarvi Anupam, and I'm pursuing MTech in Computer Aided Structural Engineering at IIIT Hyderabad. It's my honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of IS Structured Triple IT Hyderabad Students Chapter for this occasion. First and foremost, I would like to thank our eminent speaker, Dr. Martin, despite his busy schedule, has found time to grace today's webinar. Sir, I thank you for sharing your valuable knowledge on the topic, a non-engineer 2.0, a call to action, which is of great interest to all of us. Sir, the insight we received today about the messenger building practices that generally do not behave well in earthquake as demonstrated by the various uh, widespread disasters in several countries and, recent, and recently in Turkey and Syria. And due to the inadequate knowledge, uh, insufficient resources and unavailability of clear technical guidelines, these practices remain the standard in many, uh, in many regions worldwide. And we saw some quotes of different countries which, which need to be updated. Uh, now, I would like to express heartful gratitude to our faculty advisor, uh, Dr. Praveen Kumar Venkat Rao, for his valuable guidance and timely suggestions. And my sincere thanks to uh, Mr. Srikant, our IT team, Ms. Babita, and Ms. Grace, the design team, for providing all the technical support and assistance. I also thank all those who have directly or indirectly helped us to make this event successful. And my special thanks to all the participants for their active participation and enormous cooperations. Last but not the least, I also want to acknowledge the effort and cooperation of my entire team in making this webinar successful. Finally, I want to end this program by extending my sincere gratitude to all of you for being with us and making this event a grand success. It was indeed a great pleasure. Uh, so this concludes our webinar. We hope you have learned and enjoy this event. Thank you all for attending. Um, Martin, uh, thank you so much once again for accepting our invitation at a very short notice. And uh, if you allow us, uh, we have already recorded uh, this webinar. Uh, if you have a con consent, then we would like to post this video on our uh, official YouTube channel yeah. of Triple IT, so that all will be get benefited. Yes. Provided your consent is there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, all right. Martin. All right. Okay. Everyone, thanks for joining. See you next thanks time. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank Namaste. <laughs> Namaste.